Greetings, programs. This is Wretch. Welcome back to Shadowrun Hong Kong. We're on board the Bentang, guys, this floating fortress controlled by a pirate band led by Captain Utama here. And Q is in her command trailer on deck. We're going to go talk to her, but first, let's go ahead and make the rounds and see if we can interact with any of these pirates. We can already talk to the captain, but first off, we need to go ahead and spend the karma that we earned. And I'm not exactly sure what we need to spend it on. Because we've got... Where's our summoning? Because our summoning's right there at 7. We can equip Mystic Armor. See, we don't have enough... We won't have enough points to uh, really get what we want there. Body is at 7. Quickness is at 6. Well, I guess what we could do is go ahead and pump up our dodge. And that gives us six available points. Well, I don't know. Let's go, since we're not in combat right now, let's go ahead and wait on that. We'll talk to the captain. The captain's wheelhouse is surprisingly warm, despite its cold, utilitarian interior. Sounds of the sea breeze outside roll over the cabin, and a soft whistle hums through the cluttered room. You find Utama standing near a makeshift wet bar, crates and tool chests loaded full of liquor bottles, all piled onto a coffee table that sags under their weight. The captain swirls a clear, yellow-tinted liquid around the interior of a thick glass. You watch her grab a pinch of what looks like salt from a small open dish and then carefully sprinkle it into the cup. Her voice is hard when she addresses you, but her eyes remain locked on the drink, which she continues to swish around and around in ever-tightening circles. Getting acquainted with the Bentang, are we? She holds the glass up to her nose and inhales. Satisfied, she takes a sip, and her eyes flash towards you. Good. I hate drinking alone. She motion motions toward the wet bar with her elbow. Water? I'll have what you're having. A bemused grin graces the captain's scarred face. Oh? Are you sure? No questions asked? Lay it on me. Utama swirls the liquid inside her glass, then tilts it your way. Have at it. Down the cup, smell the drink. Let's go ahead and smell the drink first. Her eyebrows raise. You're cautious. Good for you. You'll outlive most of my crew with that attitude. So, what do you think? Smells sweet. Not exactly the beverage choice I'd expect from a pirate captain. The captain seems amused by your reaction. Her tusk smile looks almost ominous in the dimly lit cabin. Guava juice. Ugh. I, I personally hate guava juice. But not that concentrated swill from the convenience store. This is real, squeezed at an orchard in the Young Long district. No chemicals, no preservatives, just fruit. She takes a slow sip of her drink. With a smack of her lip, she tilts her head towards you and stares at you through dual-colored eyes. So, what brings you here? Something on your mind, Shadowrunner? I noticed a small saucer of powder over on the wet bar. What is it? Utama sniffs loudly through her nose and studies you for a moment before replying. What do you think it is? Don't know. Saw you sprinkle it into your drink, though. Ah. She rubs a hand along the back of her neck. I spent the better part of my life on the open ocean. They say when you first start sailing, you have to earn your sea legs. Otherwise, the rolling sickness will get you. I never did that. Never had to. I had my sea legs from the first time I ever set foot on a boat. Didn't realize that it could catch up to you, though. Seems that as I get older, my stomach rolls with the waves more and more. She points toward the powder in the saucer. It's anti-emetic keeps me from turning green on the job. If you ever find yourself in need of some, you help yourself to my stash, but don't overdo it. A little goes a long way. What's it like to be a female pirate? Got its ups, got its downs. Many sailing men, captains and crew alike, view female seafarers with a critical eye. We're always at a disadvantage. The glare has even landed on me from time to time. Never mind the fact that I'm one of the best damn sea captains ever to grace the ports of this sorry planet. I have to make a display of my power before I'm assumed to have it. 
On the other hand, and in that same vein, we're often underestimated, and this can work to our advantage. I'll never demean myself to gain the upper hand, but I will use a man's idiocy against him to my own benefit. There's no shame in that. The captain flicks a piece of lint off her shirt. At the end of the day, I wouldn't change things. It's a good life, and I wouldn't change it for anything. Good deal. I like the captain. That's a good, like, um, harsh, or stern but fair vibe. Andre Lukinov, or Lukinov. Racks of medical supplies and cybernetic components lined the walls of this room. Across from the doorway, heavy-duty instruments are crammed together to conserve as much space as possible. Many of them look neglected, with a fine layer of dust and grime coating every raised surface. Other implements have clearly seen such regular use that they appear polished from all the handling. A man stands toward the left side of the room. He wears a fitted, high-collared coat that looks like it gives him a lot of movement room and flexibility in his arms. A virtual retinal display hangs over his right eye, highlighting it in yellow. He greets you with a quick nod and a quick smile. Welcome, he studies your face. You're new around here, I take it. Without waiting for an answer, he continues. The name's Andre, and I'm in the wear business. I've got a large inventory if you're interested in buying. I'm more interested in answers. You have a minute? Andre's eyes narrow. He takes a half step back, cautious look on his face. Yes? What kind of answers? Who are you? Hmm. Name's Sean. I thought maybe you and I could talk about what you do here. Seems like a strange place to set up shop. The man visibly relaxes. He breathes out through his mouth and finishes the gesture with a smile. Well, sorry about that. Those who roll with pirates often have long histories of their own. I shouldn't have jumped to conclusions. I mean no offense. None taken, friend. Didn't mean to rile you up. He runs a hand behind his neck, carefully considering his next words. And slowly, he responds. No. It's not your fault. I've been too jumpy lately. Being on this boat around all these people has been stressful. It's great for business, mind you, but not for a peace of mind. I've got a few creditors after my ass, and they've made my life hell for years now. Let me guess, the Joho Lua offered you sanctuary? In a way, he lets out a sigh. Perhaps I should just tell you the story from the beginning. It would make more sense that way. I was a physician back in Russia. Worked in a trauma ward. It was an emotionally grueling profession. One thing led to another, and it wasn't long before I found myself hooked on BTL chips. That's where the debt comes in. A lot of debt. So much that there was no way I could pay it all back in my lifetime. And given my options, I decided that a do-over was in order, so I left my old life behind. Well, I tried to, at any rate. It seems that no matter where I went, my creditors were always right on my tail, all the way up until I fled to Indonesia. He smiles weakly. There, I met the glorious Captain Utama and her sailors, and the rest is history. What'd your recruitment here end up costing you? <laughs> You're a shop one. Nothing comes free, eh? The price of my asylum here was ten years of indentured service as the Benteng's onboard cyber surgeon. At the time, I thought the deal manageable, but my continuing habit has since driven those ten years of service up to thirty. So this is similar to, uh, service on, di on the Flying Dutchman. Truth is, I may die before I ever repay the captain, but let me tell you, indentured service among the Loho Juan beats the hell out of being a debtor back in the motherland. He looks contentedly around the medical bay. I've got more here than I could ever have hoped for in my old life. Hmm. Well, that was generous of them. Probably causes this crew a lot more trouble than you think. Avoiding debtors is no small task in this day and age. Eh. Let's go with how are you getting along with the pirates. I've gotten used to them, and they've gotten used to me. They can be real slave drivers at times, but at their core, they're decent people. They may have laid claim to me for the rest of my natural life, but at least they wouldn't, won't, wouldn't work a man to death. <laughs> well, not quickly, anyway. And like you said, it could be worse. I'm glad it's not. I tried to remind myself that as often as I can. I have a lot to be grateful for, even if it doesn't always feel like it. He snaps out of his nostalgia and stands up straight. His tone becomes business-like again. Anyway, is there something I can get you while you're here? Let's look at the medical supplies. We have, unfortunately, 
used quite a few. What do we got here? And we can sell, we can sell some of our stuff too. We've got the Remington shotguns. Uh, we are definitely not selling Selena. Hmm. New Ares assault rifle model that incorporates a higher velocity barrel. And got a lot of gold trauma kits. We still got a lot of med kits. I think we might be in good shape. We'll sell the punching dagger. I'm going to have to look at my inventory before we actually move out on anything. And we've got no need for cyberware. And this is the... Yeah, here's the engine room. Nothing in here of interest to us. And nothing in the mess. Alright. So let's go track down the other vendors and see where exactly... Wow, that cyber deck is floating in the air. Cooking woman. A woman in an armored trench coat hunches over a smoking grill. Her assault rifle leaned up against a nearby crate. She prods in an assortment of rapidly blackening fish, eel, squid, and other sea life, all the while fixing them with a critical glare. She glances up and squints as you approach. Huh. You're not a prisoner, and you don't look like a pirate, and this sure as hell ain't a standard tourist destination. Welcome to the Bentang, whoever you are. He's the finest pirate barge in at least a 50 mile radius. The name's Sean. Who are you? Chastity Blackwell, independent mercenary. I've seen action from Inzania to the Transpolar Alouette Nation, but for now, I'm having a bit of time off with the Johu Lua. Nobody shoots at me on the Bentang, and most of the visitors are potential clients. Seems like a good place to have a barbecue, then. You don't know the half of it, man. Take my advice and cook your own food while you're here. Utama's got a chef on her crew, but his skill set begins and ends with adding packets of instant noodle flavoring to things. The man is a culinary butcher, wanted for flavor murder across Southeast Asia. Don't trust him. Why doesn't Utama have a better cook? Honestly, I don't know. A good cook will make or break morale. Anyone who's ever served on a ship knows that. I can only assume that Rinaldi is really good at something else. From what I hear, he used to be a targeting officer on a rebel Huck mission cru or missile cruiser. Perhaps he's the guy that set up the Benteng's defensive perimeter. I'm not sure. Still, you'd think that a bunch of damn Filipino and Indonesian pirates would stock a half-decent spice cabinet. But no! It's all pre-packaged spice mixes, mostly scrounged from instant noodle packages. I'd have killed for some sambal... that word... a month ago. After Rinaldi tried to make some... The back goreng using fast food chili packets, they finally let me go ashore for supplies. What do you know about the Joho Lua? Quite a bit. They're pirates, and they live around Hong Kong, and Jomo is only slightly crazier than most of them. What else is there to know? Uh, sorry, sorry, I assume you're interested in something in particular? How'd they get started? Uh, they were Filipino refugees, mostly. Two clans, the Joho and the Loa, resisted the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. Some joined the Huk rebels, but most decided to join the Hakka fishing communities around Hong Kong. Over the years, they intermarried, at first with each other, and then with the Chinese, Indonesians, and Malaysians as well. The whole venture is pretty much a family affair. Each ship tends to be run along family lines. The captain is the family elder, backed up by their spouse as first mate. The eldest child, sometimes sibling, is the bosun, and kids are the deckhands. It seems to work out well. It's basically just a family business, and the fleets of ships are extended family. Chastity gestures toward the expanse of the Bentang, smiling crookedly. Because of that, they're united, but independent. Take the Bentang, for example. It isn't just Utama's ship, it's her family, her house, her business, and her legacy to pass on to her children. That's part of why they don't like stand-up fights as much as they do hit-and-run jobs. Nobody wants their family to get killed. Where do they operate? <laughs> They'll go anywhere in the South China Sea. I've heard stories that they go as far north as Hangzhou sometimes, and make runs to Darwin if the cargo's right. But in terms of their home base, it's been in Sai Kung for over 10 years. They're 100% Hong Kong natives, even if some of the locals don't seem to think so. I guess that's part of why I like them so much. They're kind of a mixed-up multinational family that makes the modern world so interesting. 
Their only nation is their fleet. Their language is a mix of Indonesian, Cantonese, Tagalog, Malay, Spanish, and English. They beholden to no one but themselves. Sad rule thing in this day and age. What's a pirate's life like? Chastity frowns, glancing at you in a sidelong fashion. Why are you asking me and not Jomo? You know him better than you know me, and I only know what I see from the outside. I mean, I guess that I know more about them than most people. <sighs> okay, well, I guess the first thing to know is that it isn't as glamorous as they make it out to be. Most of the Joho Lua ships are living hand to mouth. They don't have any savings, and they can wind up stranded if something breaks down at sea. It's mostly a lot of sailing around, bribery and harbor masters to find out what ships are carrying the good stuff, and then running off to steal it all. Some pirates show up with big guns. This family would rather do it with a fast hit and run. Sure, they've got big guns, but they only use them as a last resort. Ammo costs money, you know. How'd you get into cooking? Are you kidding me? Chastity smirks, folding her arms over her chest, and after a minute, her smirk fades. Oh, you're... you're serious. Okay, uh, so basically there are three types of mercenaries. She lifts a hand and starts counting off on her fingers. Uh, the first type are the ones who work for big outfits like Met 2000, Bright Blade, Tsunami, or whatever. They're not much different from corporate armies in a lot of ways. They've got tons of support and finances, so everywhere they go, they build bases with mess halls, barracks, the works. Second, you've got small units that sign up with well-established clients. They don't work for a big PMC, but maybe they've got a team of 50 or so. They get contracts from reasonably lucrative clients, and a lot of work in Africa from corporations, urban convoy uh, duty in areas that are still a bit iffy. Places like Caracas, uh, Vlad... Vladivostok, Lagos, whatever. Uh, these units rough it up a bit more, but they're usually attached to larger groups as extra muscle. Then you got people like me. True freelancers. Cowboys. We fill out the gaps in larger units, but we can never tell how big of a group we'll be with. Sometimes a corporation needs some soldiers garrisoned at some mine, and they round up ten of us and throw us out in the field with nothing but what we brought with us. Unless you've got some kind of unhealthy love for field rations, you learn to cook whatever you've got around, or you make friends with someone who does. Why hang out on a boat rather than a safe house? I like boats. I like sailors. She shrugs. I spent a lot of time as hired muscle on everything from drone container ships to small smuggling vessels. Most of those small boats were in the Aegean, though. Quick runs between small islands. Trek, I remember this one time. Jesse suddenly starts snickering to herself. The snicker becomes a chuckle, and the chuckle eventually turns to a roaring laugh as she doubles over, clutching her sides. Uh, are you alright there? Chesty begins coughing in an effort to catch her breath. <laughs> so sorry, it's just... <laughs> the fish! Finally pulling herself together, the mercenary stands up and takes a long, deep breath. Wiping a tear from her eye, she launches into a story. Okay, so this one time I was out on a fishing boat, but the skipper was actually running guns and missiles to Bari, right? Not much danger out there aside from other gun runners and pirates, so we're taking it slow. A nice, warm summer cruise. I've been amusing myself by fishing while I kept watch. I got a tug on my line and I reeled in this amazing gilt head sea bream. It was beautiful, and a good ten kilos. She stares off into the distance, shaking her head in disbelief. I knew right then it's what we were having that for dinner that night. That's a hell of a big fish. One of the other mercs on the boat was this elf pistol adept. Fastidious guy. Liked his fine wine and food. Anyway, he sidles up and asks what I'm going to do with it. What do you think I'm going to do, I say. I'm going to grill it up with some olive oil, lemons, and garlic. You know, standard Greek-style stuff. Well, the elf gets a look like I slapped his mother. He just screws his face up into a sneer and asks what the hell is wrong with me. And I ask him how he'd do it. You have to poach a fish like that. Lay down a bed of pilaf rice, zucchini, bell peppers, and onions. You cook it slow in foil with a touch of wine. Only a barbarian would grill it, he says to me. Chassie dips her head, grinning. That wasn't something I was prepared to hear. I explained to him that, uh, preserve the, that to preserve the fish's natural flavor, grilling was a superior choice. I might have suggested he had delusions of aristocracy. He countered that his method would create a superior flavor profile overall, as well as be a complete meal, and questioned my mother had been a goat and my father a chimpanzee. Ooh, that escalated quickly. 
That went on until he had his cult manhunter's barrel halfway into my mouth and my combat knife was pressing against his trachea. We would have kept our argument up, too, if the first mate hadn't doused us with a fire hose. All this over how to cook a fish? Hey, I don't know what it's like from where you're from, pal, but in my book, dinner is very serious business. Anyway, we got blasted with a fire hose and the fish got blasted through a scupper and back out the sea. The whole argument wound up sort of fizzling out. I think we ended up having spam and eggs instead. Interesting people on this boat. And... Friendly Orc, huh? That's an oxymoron. Ah, some of the officers actually made it back, so they aren't on the payroll. Oh, we can go on the bolt hole, too, and talk to the crew. With an easy smile and relaxed body language, something about this orc seems intrinsically pleasant, despite the myriad guns and swords laying on the table near him. He raises a hand in greeting as you approach. Hey, stranger. Always nice to see a new face out here. Nice to meet you, too. You part of the crew? Who, me? Nah, man. I'm just hanging out until my next job. I know some of the crew, and it's a good transit hub if you're looking to go places by ship and stay off official records. Pretty cool place, truth be told. The name's Garrick, by the way. Wandering Swordsman. At your service. What kind of swordsmanship do you practice? A couple of styles. My first was Choi Li Foot, but I picked up some Taijijian, too. Garrick gestures toward a broad blade sword laying on the table near him. I'm a fan of the Dao over the Energian. The weight feels better in my hand than that tiny blade. Orc hands and all that. Where are you from? Garrick doesn't sound like a Chinese name. I grew up on a street in Oakland, California, Free State. You know, Orkland. <laughs> Garrick gestures toward his two tusks, grinning. Non-humans weren't very welcoming in San Francisco after Japan began protecting it. Anybody who wasn't highly connected or a normal human got shoved out. I mean, you know how it is. A lot of people hate anyone with tusks or horns, right? Well, the Japanese in San Francisco took it to the next level. Maybe they saw it as their duty to clean up the city. Or maybe it was greed for the land folks own. But either way, whoop, out we went. At gunpoint. I was born a little after all that, but my parents told me about it. What's the California Free State like these days? Kind of a pile of crap. San Francisco's all wrapped up by the Japanese megas. Their playground, basically. Los Angeles is an independent city-state. When you're... Biggest claims to power and fame are Sacramento and Ventura. You know you're really scraping the barrel. Nah, I don't miss it. Not one bit. How'd you end up in Hong Kong? Garrick snaps his fingers excitedly. Ha <laughs> ha! This ties into my tragic past. A tale of revenge and foreign lands, swords and sorcery, of dead parents and the criminal underworld. You're awfully excited about a terrible event. Well, what do you expect? It happened when I was a kid, and that was ages ago. I lived in a slum, surrounded by gangers and junkies. Objectively speaking, it was probably the best thing that happened to me. Got me out of Orkland. I got into the corner store, and when I got back home, my home was on fire. Mom and Dad had been hacked up with a machete. Don't know why. Maybe a BTL debt. Maybe they just got on the wrong side of one of the local gangs. Long story short, a local fixer felt bad and took me in. Started me off as an assistant and moved me up to be his muscles as I got older. That sounds kind of like uh, Raymond and Sean. Sounds like a familiar story to me. Figured it might. People like us, we tend to come from the same kind of places. Nobody gives up easy street for a life of crime unless they're seriously screwed up in the head. Well, it's a better life than begging or being at the bottom of the food chain, yeah? Anyway, once I was old enough, Big Sven, the fixer, hooked me up with the Choi Li Fu Sifu. That was when I got my first street chops. Odd jobs here and there. And I'm not an adept, so I had to scrounge to install whatever wear I could afford. I'm out here because my Sifu figured it's time for me to learn from other masters. I've been visiting monks, triad enforcers, and back alley schools for months now. How'd you get into the whole wandering swordsman thing? Seems a bit melodramatic. I grew up on stories about wandering Jing Hu swordsmen and other martial artists. I loved reading books like The Water Margin, The Deer in the Cauldron, A Journey to the West. There's a kind of romance to it that appealed to me. Still does. An outlaw living by their own code, fighting the mighty powers and living by their own wits. Beats the usual story I knew. Born poor, starve, die poor. 
Garrick gestures off toward the distance. Most people out there haven't got a shred of hope that there's anything better. When you live like that, it grinds you down. I figure if I can see my life as a modern version of one of those classics, I'll keep my spirits up. And that's worth more to me than all the new yen in the world. Are you looking to avenge your parents? I guess. If it comes up or if I hear something. Seems like the kind of thing I should be honor bound to do, but it was so damn long ago I figure I can afford to let it sit a bit longer. Garrick shrugs, spreading his arms helplessly. Maybe that's kind of weird, but I don't want that part of my past to define me. See you later, Garrick. Hope you find who you're looking for. Hey, thanks. If it happens, it happens. If not, at least I'll have an interesting trip. That's the thing, really. But where you live, live where you are. Make sense? Very zen, Garrick. I like him. Okay, here is Officer Hoy. The constable's attention is locked onto his PDA's display. He inhales through his nose and then speaks. Just because I'm standing here doesn't mean I'm not busy. He shrugs, his tattoos moving with the rise and fall of his shoulders. State your business. What do you do when you're not being a cop? He seems to be taking this awfully well. What do I do? You mean, like, my hobbies? It's kind of a strange thing to ask. I guess that it might be. I just like to get to know the people I'm working with. He shrugs. Uh, sure. Okay. I paint. Oils. Mostly landscapes. Had a few showings in Victoria Harbor coffee shops. Could we change the subject, maybe? This is getting a little too personal for my tastes. Oh, he's an oil painter. That's cool. Nice neck tattoo. Were you a ganger before you became a cop? Yeah, I got jumped in when I was a kid. In my old neighborhood, it was impossible not to be. I got out when I was a teenager. Turned my life around. When I landed in the HKPF, they put my background to good use by sending me over undercover. You were a narc? Yep. I worked undercover for a couple of Kowloon City's nastier street gangs. The Black Butchers and the 444s. Helping to bring them down from the inside. Glad to be off of that detail. I was good at it, but doing that sort of work takes a toll. So how'd you wind up on this task force? My cover got blown. Barely made it out of a 444 territory alive. I couldn't stay undercover any longer, so they had to find another use for me. When Lamb told me about the task force, I volunteered. So he volunteered... Ew. Well, I don't know about that. Now, it looks like we've got... Man, we got a lot of people to talk to. Holy crap. Well, we'll go ahead and just make it a long one. Hello there, Sergeant. The Sergeant takes a long drag on her cigarette before meeting your gaze. She looks preoccupied with something. So, here you are. She closes her eyes and allows the smoke to spill from her lips. When she opens them again, they're on you. What brings you to my corner of the yard, Shadowrunner? Thought that you could help me get my bearings here. Well, now that the shock's worn off, you got questions, huh? She taps her cigarette, spilling ash to the ground. Alright. Tell me what you want to know. I actually think we probably should have been doing these a little bit earlier, but I don't know how we actually would have pulled it off. How'd you wind up with this gig? Things were getting stale back in the office. She grabs her nose and gives it a short rub and sniffs. Actually, they've been stale for a few years. I need it out. How that lifeless recycled air, the constant sound of typing fingers, and the suffocating stench of cologne. She looks like she might gag. I could smell my old boss coming from down the hall. Enjoying this change in scenery? It has its ups and downs. And ups and downs. And ups and downs. It took me a while to get past the subtle bobbing and swaying of things near the docks. I used to feel nauseated if I stared at one place for too long. I managed to get past that, but I doubt that I'd last long out on the water. Still, it's improvement over the office. I'd rather feel sick outside than sick in a tiny room. What do you do when you're not being a cop? It's hard to clock out once you've gotten your badge. A lot of rookies don't realize that it's a 24-7 lifestyle, and the better you get, the more it engulfs you. She taps her cigarette, and a small clump of glowing ash hits the ground. It's like a radar that won't turn off, or a sixth sense, or whatever. 
She rolls the small stick between her fingers. Point is, I don't get any free time. Okay. Then what would you do if you did have free time? The sergeant lets out a single short laugh, but looks unamused. She raises her hands in a shrug. <laughs> I'm doing what I want to be doing. Don't misunderstand that. But if my schedule allowed me a moment or two to myself, i do what I assume is the usual. Binge watch some sims, go out to eat. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'd have a dog or a cat. Yeah, a cat. N no, a gerbil. Easier. You don't strike me as a rodent person. Not in general. Their tails disgust me, but gerbils? Their tails have hair, and that changes everything. You asked. Hmm. Well, they seem to be taking their lot in this a lot better than some of the others. Maybe Q hasn't told them how deep this goes. A bored-looking pirate stands amid a collection of sea mines, a spiral brown and laminated manual in one hand. The cover reads, Ares MK-62 Naval Mind. He's busily thumbing through it, a sour expression on his face. Hey, you need something? The pirate tosses the manual onto the ground near him. Just looking around. Well, look away, friend. You're free to roam wherever you like. Just don't touch these mines. Pretty sure that's self-explanatory, but it's worth mentioning. The pirate jerks a thumb towards the mines. The only reason that the Bentang and our other ships are safe is that we got enough explosives to level a small island. Without them, we'd be fighting off other pirates left and right. Mines are the pirate code for don't even think about it. You like it here? Like has nothing to do with it. These pirates are my family, so I gotta stick by them. But yeah, I guess I do. I'd rather be on a beach with a bottle of whiskey, but I can sail to a beach and we've got whiskey in the hold. Nobody's asking me to get shot at, and we're prosperous enough to feed ourselves. It's not a bad life, all things considered. Besides, I don't know how to do anything else aside from set up and disarm explosives. Not exactly a normal job. Would you give it up if you could have a normal life? I don't know. Maybe? Hard to say. It's like this. I've spent so long as a sailor that I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't on a boat, surrounded by bombs. Kind of messed up when I say it out loud, but that's the truth of it. Why are you on mine prep duty? Eh, simple. I spent 12 years with the British Royal Navy as an explosive ordnance disposal technician. Oh, I, okay, I guess I need to change the voice. If it explodes, I know how to set it up or get rid of it. I wouldn't trust anybody else out here to handle them, that's for damn sure. Nobody else is trained. Strange place to find a British naval officer. Sure is, but life itself is strange. People always have an idea of where they think they'll end up, but most people don't follow that clean route. They just go where life leads them. After 12 years with Her Majesty's salty service, my main aim was to get drunk and forget all about being a sailor. I packed my kit and went out into the world. Ended up in Manila, half dead of alcoholism, and met a local girl named Christina. That kind of turned into Australian, isn't it? It got serious. She introduced me to her family, and it turned out they were pirates. After we got married, I figured I might as well make myself useful, so here we are, priming minds. The more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Same to you. Stay safe. Well, that's not my best accent work. Not to say that I've ever had good accent work, but, you know, I get, I get points for trying. Shut up. Triple Alpha. A powerfully built woman stands by one of the huge guns, smoking a cigarette. She's carrying a cyber deck, and an assault rifle is slung alongside it. She has the wide-eyed alertness of someone who's either supernaturally hyper-aware, or has a lot of headwear. Her stance is easy and relaxed. It's the posture of someone who's ready to fight or flee at a moment's notice, but doesn't expect that she'll have to. The woman nods her head to you, taking a drag on her cigarette. You must be Sean. Heard about that dust-up at the Tiger's Den. Glad to see you got out alive. Yeah, me too. You work with Utama and her crew? Nah, first time here. I'm just waiting for the rest of my crew to show up. The woman looks you up and down. You look exactly like I thought you would. Heard some stories about that business with Josephine Sang. You can call me Triple Alpha, by the way. Us old runners, we gotta stick together, you know? 
You stand by your crew, they stand by you, and you can't count on anyone else. She purses her lips, looking around with an annoyed expression. <laughs> if my crew would ever freaking get here, why am I always the first one on the scene anyway? I want to get out of the shadows and onto a beach. You look le like you've seen a lot of action yourself. Alpha lets out a rough cackle. <laughs> Man, you don't know the half of it. You tally up the runs I've been on, I think I might have seen more stuff than even Fast Jack. Might not be as old as him, but I think that I take jobs a lot more regularly than he does. I've been to Los Angeles and Seattle, Hong Kong and Berlin, and everywhere in between. If it's a weapon, I've fired it. If there's a corporation, I've run both for and against it. The woman gestures languidly with her cigarette as she speaks. It's never dull, I'll tell you that. How big of a team do you have? Now we've got a rigger, a mage, and an adept. I guess there's also our jack-of-all-trades, too. She's not really very good at anything, but she's got a lot of heart. Totally unafraid to march alongside us, even if all she can manage is to plink away with that crappy pistol of hers. And then there's me. You can guess what I do. Alpha gestures to the cyber deck and the assault rifle slung across her back. Sounds like a solid crew. They're a good bunch. Highly skilled, quiet, and we get along well. You can't ask for more than that. Are you staying out of the shadows for good? Alpha shakes her head and stares off in the distance. Nah, I don't think so. I've been running the shadows for my whole life. That's all I've ever done. Don't know how to do anything else. This is more of a vacation. A break, if you will. I figure we take a break, hit some beaches, take in the sights that are off the beaten path, and come back when we're rested. You keep doing the same thing forever, you're bound to burn out. Alpha glances side along at you and gives you a little grin. I wouldn't mind a little time off, I admit. Maybe you'll get the chance after you handle whatever's left for you in Hong Kong. You can always travel around the world, after all. It's a little bittersweet, I guess. Not sure how long we're going to be out of the life. It'll be a few years, at least. A lot of our gear and cyberware is getting old, and it's harder to keep up with the other runners out there. That kind of upgrade takes time, you know? Not only do you have to track down the new stuff, you have to recuperate and all that. Pretty sure we'll be back, though. And when we are... She makes a low whistle and grins wildly. <whistles> Better watch out, because we'll be top of the line. So what are you going to do once you're out? Aside from hit a nice beach somewhere? I don't know. There's plenty of interesting stuff to see around the world. She takes a drag on her cigarette and ponders the question. I want to see some old ruins. You know, temples, castles, stuff like that. I like history, so I'm always excited when I get to go to older cities like Rome or Athens. Heck, with as much money as I've got, maybe I'll take a trip into space and play tourists there, too. Never been to space before. I'll well, see you later, Alpha. Hey, you take care of yourself, okay? It's a rough world out there, and nobody's gonna look out for you except your crew and yourself. I like your style. I kinda feel like we've seen the same kind of runs, so watch your back, okay? He takes a long drag on her cigarette and flicks the butt away before lighting a new one. Always, Alpha. Good man. Never hurts to be careful. She touches two fingers to her brow with a wry salute. Good luck. I think we might run into each other again, after I've gotten upgraded and taken a bit of a break. Looking forward to it when it happens. Hmm. That's interesting. And finally, we got Quartermaster. Back for more gear? You've got the scratch. I can hook you up. Oh, awesome. Okay, so we don't have to do anything with him. We've already done all the dialogue options. Alright, so we've explored the deck of the Bentom. Got some interesting, very eclectic people here. Oh, we can still talk to him. Why for? Oh, nothing at the moment. Um, when Let's go ahead and get on board the bolt hole. Do we actually have to people to talk to there? Uh oh Well, everything seems to be more or less in one piece. Did you and Q get every anything figured out? More to the point, do you know who we're fighting yet? Not yet. She wants me to meet her to go over what we have. Might as well get to it then, because we got nothing. Oh, and Caleb, hurry. These choppy waters are doing a number on my stomach, and I'm fresh out of Dramamine. Ooh, bless his heart. Okay, guys, well, 
we will go ahead and end the episode here. And when we get back, we will head to the command trailer, talk to Q, and get this show on the road. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you liked the episode, go ahead and click like down below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. That'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.